from pride to humility. We're continuing the study on the book of Daniel. And the title, by my opinion, says it all. Today our thoughts are about King Nebuchadnezzar and his journey from pride to humility. How did it happen for him? Pride and humility is a huge topic. Is it all negative about pride? Are there things that is good to be proud of? How about humility? Is it, does it mean to have no self-confidence at all? To always bow low? Well, it's important to establish that this lesson and this story are in the context of a relationship with God. The king of Babylon has already the chance to meet the three young Jews who outperformed their peers in three years schooling or training. <laughs> Not only that, but he also saw the fourth person walking in the fiery furnace with those three friends from Judea. And thirdly, he had some troubling thoughts and dream that actually was interpreted by Daniel for him. In chapter 4, we see that he has a new vision, a new dream, and it's about a big, huge tree that reaches up in heaven. However, there is again something troubling there, and it is that his mind will be changed from that of mind of a man to a mind of a beast. And this part of the vision and the dream, the king did not understand. So, about 12 months after receiving the vision, the king is walking on the roof of his palace and he starts praising himself. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? And this is exactly where the mystery part of his dream came to fulfillment, unfortunately. And this is the interesting part for me. Nebuchadnezzar met and witnessed the power of God. But his reaction was more like, okay, how can I use this? How can I make this God and his big power work for me? And this is where it gets very relevant because consciously or unconsciously, we are doing the same. We are approaching God as a matter of power. And it takes a very deep personal experience to break that and to be able to look at God in a different way. God has warned the king of what will come if he does not humble himself. In fact, when interpreting the dream, the prophet Daniel told him that there is a way out. And I quote, if he breaks off his sins by being righteous and by showing mercy to the poor. <laughs> And obviously the king failed in both of those departments. The king, in other words, was out of touch with the common people in his kingdom, with the poor, with those who were suffering. On the contrary, he was full of himself, full of, of his pride, and the lack of recognition of God's sovereignty brought him to a state of mental condition where he lived like an animal. It seems like that even after all that has happened in his life, his encounter with God and Daniel and the three Jewish friends, he was still, the king was still going after his own glory. <laughs> how do you humble yourself when you, have, when you have the whole world at your disposal? And how do you change your thoughts and your motivation when everything around you screams how great you are? So he was given about a year to do something with the message that he got. But it wasn't clicking for the king. After all, he had a big kingdom to run. He couldn't afford to look weak. And things were actually running great. He was successful. <laughs> we are so much in the same boat. We have so many things to do. We want to be successful. We have responsibilities. And as life goes by, we either get crushed by our failures or we ride on the success. <laughs> Many of us even have met and know God, know about the power of God. We have learned about faith. We may even have faith. But we still can't look at God the way that makes a difference. 
Yes, the king got stricken by a mental condition, probably clinical zoanthropy or species dysphoria, which made him feel like living in the body of an animal. He lost everything, not only the possessions that he had, but also his consciousness and his identity as a human being. Seven years pass by and he's restored back to his sound state of mind. He's also restored as a king by his loyal nobles. And most importantly, at the end, he says this. I raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him, him who lives forever. <laughs> Lesson learned. Easy? Not at all. I don't think it's easy for us to cool down our ego and our pride and figure out our relationship with the Most High. <laughs> don't we all struggle with that? And why am I saying this? Because somewhere at the beginning of the lesson, the author, Elias de Souza, says it very clearly, and I quote, Pride has been called the first sin. Pride leads to Lucifer's fall, so now he instills pride in men to go down a path toward destruction. King Nebuchadnezzar's journey has been one of choosing between God and Lucifer, of choosing between humility and pride. After this dramatic experience, he lifted his eyes toward heaven, and now he was able to see things differently. I hope that we don't have to go through such madness as Nebuchadnezzar, but we do need a dramatic change in the perspective of our relationship with God. The story ends with King Nebuchadnezzar praising and glorifying the King of Heaven. There was no doubt anymore in his mind who rules the world. The king has changed his set of values and he's recognized his limitations as a human being. Something magical happens in our life when we're not pretending anymore of somebody that we're not. And somehow it's a happier life and it's lighter to live. Does that change the zest? that we can have of reaching new horizons? No, it doesn't. However, we're not walking our life alone anymore. So let it be praise to God, who is our mentor and our leader, who has a patient, loving heart. Join us again next week to continue the study with a lesson from arrogance to destruction. <laughs>